So look, I'm going to be real with you, right? One of my biggest challenges in life is communicating clearly. Clarity is not one of my most endearing qualities. And it sometimes acts as a barrier to being understood. I mean, ever since I was a young boy, people would have a hard time understanding what I was trying to say. I can't tell you the number of times that I've been told, slow down, Tobias. Or when I was speaking, could you repeat that? People couldn't understand what I was trying to say. So you get used to the stressed face, the slightly lean to one side, the furrow brow, and the confused and quizzical look. I've worked hard and continue to work hard on being clear, mainly because I want to keep my marriage and also because God has a sense of humor in putting me in the pulpit and calling me as a preacher. But I've had to become clear or learn to become clear because over time you realize that one of the greatest needs that we have as humans is to be understood. The ability to understand someone and to make yourself understood is important to communication. Someone thought Sinclair B. Ferguson that great Scottish theologian and preacher needed to hear this. So they told him, maybe after one of his sermons, that he needed to preach more clearly and simply in a way that people can understand, kind of like Jesus. Clearly, this person understood that Jesus was a great teacher, yes, but they clearly couldn't recognize that even Jesus was misunderstood at times. At least that's the impression you get when you're reading our text this morning. Because in this scene, you have Jesus and 12 disciples trying to make sense of what it is he's trying to say. Jesus says in verses 16 to 17, that in a little while, you will see me no more. And after a little while, you will see me. The disciples, with furrowed brows and quizzical looks, they all ask each other, what in the world is he talking about? Now, for someone who struggles at times to be clear, I mean, this is a great consolation. I mean, knowing that even Jesus could be misunderstood. But it's one thing to be misunderstood because the communicator struggles to be clear in his own mind as to what he's trying to say, which is often my dilemma. But that doesn't seem to be the case here. Jesus is very clear on what he wants to communicate to his disciples. The disciples simply did not have the spiritual understanding or discernment to grasp what Jesus was trying to say. But Jesus doesn't want his disciples to wonder what he meant. He wants them to understand. So here's what Jesus wants his disciples to be clear on. He wants them to be clear on their future sorrow, their future pain and adversity, but he also wants them to be clear on their future hope, future sorrow and future hope. Now, Jesus, up until this point, he often talked about his future suffering and his death. And this must have been hard for his disciples because you see, at this point, they must have been used to having Christ around. He was their rabbi. He was their teacher. He was their friend. He was their Messiah. So all of this talk of him leaving must have been a bit too much for them. I mean, it certainly was too much for Peter. I mean, Peter even went as far as rebuking Jesus on one occasion. Remember Matthew chapter 16? Jesus again talks about his death. And Peter responds, Lord, this shall never happen to you. There's no way that your enemies will triumph over you. We won't let that happen. 
To which Jesus responds in kind with a rebuke of his own. He says, get thee behind me, Satan. For you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. In other words, Peter, you're letting Satan blind you from understanding the will of God. You acknowledge rightly that I am Messiah and king, but what you fail to see is that I cannot be a king without a cross. I cannot give life without first laying down my life. So he says in verse 16, in a little while you will see me no more. And the disciples, they seem perplexed by this statement. And the disciples are not alone. This statement has been the subject of much debate, even for 21st century disciples. What does Jesus mean? Is Jesus talking about going to heaven and then coming back in the power of the Spirit? Or is Jesus giving reference to the time when he will leave this planet and the disciples will no longer see him until the end of the age? Now, I believe that there is some truth in each of these Theories, but I think the most natural reading of this text suggests that Jesus is initially talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. In other words, Jesus is saying that in a little while, in less than 24 hours, he would be tried as a criminal and he would be put on the cross. His body would be consigned to the grave and closed with a massive tomb. But then a few days later would come the resurrection where they would see him again. Now we have the hindsight of knowing this, but the disciples' confusion is because they are trying to understand Jesus' leaving without fully understanding his rising again. You see, without the resurrection in a little while, it makes no sense. And I love this scene in verse 17 where the disciples are talking amongst themselves trying to work out what all of this means. Because all they want is clarity. They want to be able to follow Jesus and, and his understanding of what it is he's trying to communicate. It can be stressful not knowing. It's like sitting in a classroom, listening intently to a teacher, but not fully grasping what he's trying to say. Have you ever had a teacher like that? You just couldn't follow for the life of you. And you're like, either this teacher is brilliant and really smart, or I'm really dumb. Because I'm just not getting it. Eventually, Jesus looks at them. He sees them trying to understand. They're struggling. And so he steps in and he says, look, let me clear this up for you. In a little while, I'm going to be taken away from you and your heart will be filled with grief. You will mourn. You will lament. And you'll tear your garments. And you'll cry, woe is me. And you'll find yourself in a dark place wondering what just happened. And they will weep not only for themselves, but they'll also weep for him. They'll weep for their friend, for their rabbi, for their Messiah, the one who was altogether perfect, the one who was altogether lovely and patient and truthful and kind. Their hearts will be filled with sorrow, watching him being treated with contempt and sadistic cruelty. The fact that they will suffer such agony will cause them indescribable sorrow in their soul. But on the other hand, the world will rejoice. They will be filled with, with joy because this unbelieving world of both Jews and Gentiles, they saw Jesus as a troublemaker. Jesus was one who made them feel increasingly uncomfortable by his mere presence on earth. The world is going to rejoice when Jesus is disposed of because he had exposed their sin. He had exposed the darkness in their own heart. 
He had uncovered their guilt. His very life was a daily rebuke of their idolatry and immorality. They were quite thrilled that Jesus would be humiliated and executed and removed from their midst. Because as Jesus said in John chapter 7, verse 7, that the world hates me because I testify about it. And I testify that its works are evil. So let me be clear, Jesus is saying to them, in a little while you will be filled with sorrow. That is not how the story ends. So Jesus also wants to be clear on the future hope that they will have. You see, I'm sure you've heard the expression before that, look, troubles don't last always. Or the darkest hours is just before the break of day. Now, look, these expressions are meant to be encouraging. but They can seem a little trite to someone who is going through a very difficult time. I mean, what is the assurance that I'm going to get through this pain? What is the assurance that I'm going to get through this divorce? What is the assurance that my health is going to get better? What is the assurance that my kids who are walking away from God will once again come back to discover the truth of who he is? Thanks for the encouragement, but thanks for telling me that troubles won't last always, but what is the assurance that I have that that is true? But here Jesus is reassuring his disciples that they will experience sorrow, but it won't last. You see, this phrase in a little while describes a sort of short interval of pain and sorrow and grief. And it may seem like an eternity when you have to endure so much difficulty. It was R.C. Sproul who put it this way when he said, look, 10 minutes in the ice cream parlor is a little while, but 10 minutes in a dentist chair is an eternity. But what Jesus is wanting to reassure his disciples of is that you will experience sorrow now, but the hope is that your sorrow will turn to joy. And so he reinforces this with an analogy. In verse 21, he compares what is about to happen to him and to his disciples to that of a pregnant woman who is about to give birth. A woman experiencing labor, she goes through great pain. But when her child is born, her suffering is forgotten and it is replaced by rejoicing. Here's what Jesus wants his disciples to understand. The joy that a child has been born does not merely follow the pain of labor. It is through the pain of labor that the joy of birth, of the birth comes. You know, I have a tendency, right, of telling embarrassing stories about my wife without first getting her permission. And I believe it was Rico Tice who noticed that, so he gave me some advice one day. He said, brother, always ask your wife for permission before sharing stories about her in your sermon. So as I'm writing this sermon, I, I, I think about that and I say, okay. So I go up to my wife and I say, Angela, would you mind if I share one of your birthing stories? <laughs> to which she replied, absolutely not. And see, Rico, this is why I don't ask for permission. <laughs> because I know that she's probably going to say no. So now I'm up here with this sermon, and I don't have a birthing story to share. <laughs> Thank you, Rico. But the point Jesus is trying to make is that the pain is productive of the joy Sinclair Ferguson says that this is consistent with New Testament teaching about the relationship between tribulation and joy, between the relationship of suffering and glory. True, there is suffering now, 
but there will be glory then. See, this was true of Jesus, who the Hebrew writer says that for the joy that was set before him, what did he do? He endured. He endured the cross, despising the shame. Jesus endured the cross because of the joy of knowing the eternal life that his resurrection would bring for many. See, the Son of God made it through Friday because he kept his eyes on Sunday. He knew that his rising from the dead would produce in his disciples the joy and happiness that is similar to a mother who forgets the agony of childbirth once her newborn son or daughter is placed in her arms. This is precisely what happened when Jesus appeared to his disciples on that Sunday morning. We read in John chapter 20, verse 20, that the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. It is this gladness of heart. It is this joy that the resurrection produces that is the basis of their future hope. You see, the disciples had to wait for their joy. They had to endure a great sorrow without any real clarity on the hope of the resurrection. But we don't have to wait to experience this joy and this gladness as the disciples did. We can have hope that produces joy even in the midst of the most painful of circumstances now. And why? Because we know that Jesus is alive. And the reality of his resurrection from the dead is the assurance that he will never die again. He will never be taken from us. His presence, his love and commitment to us is steadfast. And it is steadfast even until the very end of time. We have this ironclad promise from the Lord. That never, never will I leave you and never will I forsake you. So you can say with confidence that the Lord is my help. The Lord who made heaven and earth is my help. And I will not be afraid. I will not be afraid in the valley. I will not be afraid when I'm faced with the reality of death because I know that when I die, I'm going to see Jesus. I'm going to see my Savior face to face. Hallelujah. I will not be afraid when I've been given an insurmountable task to do because I know that the Lord Emmanuel is with me. And not only is he with me, but he will help me through it all. Look, if we had, if all we had was the cross to look to, then we can die with our sins forgiven. But it is the resurrection that gives hope. This hope, Jesus says in verse 22, produces a joy that no one can take away. And the foundation of this never-ending joy is the very presence of Jesus among his people. The Lord's words here, I will see you again, not only refers to his resurrection, but also to his ongoing presence with them through his spirit. This also refers to the hope of the unmediated access that we have with the Father In that day, a familiar relationship whereby we could approach God as Abba Father. A guarantee that Jesus is promising his disciples, which was unheard of before this time. To go into the presence of God and call him Father. And not only that, but that we can approach God as Father and have the confidence of knowing that if we prayed in Jesus' name, that not only will he hear our prayers, 
but he will answer them. And he'll answer them so that our joy may be complete. Now let's be clear. Jesus is not advocating a genie in a bottle approach to prayer whereby God serves our every whims and desire. The condition of verse 24 is contingent on his previous teachings of the abiding life in John chapter 14 Verse 7, Jesus tells his disciples, look, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, then you'll ask what you will and it shall be done for you. This was Jesus' words. These were his condition, conditions, contingents. And he says that this is for his father's glory. It is the ongoing relationship that the disciples will have with Jesus through the Spirit where when they abide in him and when they keep his commandments that they can expect to receive of the Father. And why? Because the Father loves his children. The Father loves his children and he longs to give them good things. And secondly, because when we seek God, we align our desires and our wants with his. So when we pray, asking in Jesus' name, then we can have the confidence that whatever we ask according to his will, he will hear us and he will answer. Because the Father wants to be glorified and he wants us to be filled with joy. So look, as we end, here's what I believe Jesus wants us to be clear on in the new year. In the new year, you will experience some sorrow. You will experience some pain and you will experience some sadness. You will experience the struggles with sin. Jesus told his disciples that I tell you these things before they happen. Because you live in this world and in this world you will have trouble. You will experience hardship. You may get a bad note from your doctor. Your plans might be disrupted because of COVID. Or you may find yourself in a season where you're struggling with doubt. But what Jesus also wants those who trust in him to be clear on is the hope that they have because of the resurrection. This hope produces an unshakable joy that comes from knowing the lasting and immutable presence of Christ in our lives. This joy comes from knowing that he will never leave us nor forsake us. This joy comes from knowing that our sins are forgiven and that we have peace with God. This joy comes from knowing that we can enjoy an intimate relationship with the Father through the Holy Spirit whereby we can come boldly and to his presence with confidence. Believing that my father who loves me delights to hear me. And he longs to answer my prayers. So when you find yourself in a difficult season this year, press into God. Seek his face. Seek the Lord Jesus. Seek his presence. If you're not clear on any other resolution that you've made this year, be clear on this, that the nearness of God is my good. Let your resolve be as David who said in Psalm 73 that it is good for me to draw near to God. It is good that I make the sovereign Lord my refuge. See, David's desire to draw near to God because he knew that in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. And at his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore.
And as we seek to abide in him, and as we seek his presence, he will fill us with hope that produces a joy that this world with all of its charms and enticements, it simply cannot give. And this world with all of its troubles and adversities, it simply cannot take away. Christian, be clear on the hope that you have in 2022. Amen.